Welcome to the Moneyball Clinic. I took the top 30 leagues, simulated them in full detail, then smashed it all together to create an aggregated database. This will be the baseline, from which I'll be taking a look at a different team each episode, analysing their squad, creating a simple tactic, and using performance data to suggest practical transfer targets. Throughout history, there have been some memorable partnerships. Lennon and McCartney, Morecambe and Wise, Fred and Rose. One combination that won't be added to that list is Dino Topmuller and Eintracht Frankfurt, according to FM at least. Despite being predicted to finish fifth, Frankfurt disappointed on every single occasion. A solitary seventh place finish sat amongst a sea of mid table anonymity. And then there's this relegated. On average, Frankfurt were the fifth worst team, scoring just 32 goals, conceding 39, and accruing only 39 and a half points. All considered, it would be an achievement to secure the fifth place finish they were predicted. But we can do better, I hope. There is a big gap between Bundesliga's top four teams and the rest, but Champions League qualification is the goal. Before we look at the squad, there is one thing we already know. Topmuller sucked. Topmuller sucked so much that he was sacked on all but one occasion, and this causes us a problem. You see, I like to dig into the simulation that most closely resembles Frankfurt's average, but doing so would mean a season under the stewardship of two different managers. That's two different tactical systems, and players performing in potentially two vastly different roles with no way to distinguish between the two. And so, we can only assess based on the following simulation, where Frankfurt finished 11th, which was above their average, but also their second worst display in terms of goals scored. Now, Tom Miller played a 3-4-3, something a bit like this, with a surprising amount of symmetry. Two wide centre-backs, two complete wing-backs, two ball-winning midfielders, and two advanced playmakers. A 3-2 build-up structure with the wing-backs getting forward to provide the width and create the front five. Solid. Except it's not. There is a disconnect between the defensive and attacking units with no roles inclined to help with ball progression and the front line is over-reliant on a single goal-scoring threat. This should be easy to fix. But first, the players. We'll only look at those who played 900 minutes or more the equivalent of 10 full games. Kevin Trapp in goal. An astonishing 0.34 xG prevented shows he's an exceptional shot stopper. His passing metrics are solid, if unspectacular. He is serviceable in build-up. Tutor at right centre-back. A 78% tackle win rate is good, but his aerial numbers are a little concerning. He's winning the majority at 61%, involved in so few overall. On the ball, he is safe, losing possession only 3.2 times per 90. He's in the 55th percentile for progressive passes, but when compared to overall passes completed, he is only looking to aid progression 8% of the time. That is low. Robin Cock anchors the defensive three, and his output is very similar. A better contribution aerially, both in terms of headers 1 per 90 and header win rate, a slightly lower tackle success percentage. There's not too much discernible difference. William Pacho at left centre-back. He has the best tackle win rate and header win rate of the starting defenders. He was also the most progressive in terms of carries, although all three contributed in this area. Pavoya Smolcic was a capable backup. Not as involved in progression, as shown by his lower passes completed metric, but a fantastic tackler and aggressive in aerial duels. Ahead of them was the double pivot of Elias Skiri and Sebastian Roder. Skiri was very good. In the 95th percentile for possession one, and with an 80% tackle success rate, his defensive contribution was elite. 10% of his completed passes were progressive, and whilst modest, his 0.11 expected assists is not too bad from a primarily defensive player. Now I'd like to remind everyone about a little Eurodance hit from the early 90s. No Limit by 2 Unlimited. 
2 Unlimited were fronted by singer Anita Dells and rapper Ray Slingard. No Limit was their biggest hit, with each part written by the respective member. Anita wrote the melody and the lyrics and the hook, whilst Ray wrote the following. They received equal writing credits. Just thought it was interesting. Anyway, Sebastian Roder. Sebastian Roder was shite, and it's understandable why he's decided to hang up his boots at the end of the season. Christian Jakic was used as a backup and was a marginal improvement in every single area. He might be serviceable. At wingback, we had Eric Jr. Dina Abimbe on the right. So good, they named him four times. We can clearly see his remit was limited. Run with the ball, set up chances, and harass the opponents. He was pretty good at all these things, and absolutely useless at everything else. On the opposite flank, Philip Max. He was marginally worse at the attacking things, and marginally better at the defensive things. It is clear, however, that both wingbacks' statistical output is being shaped almost exclusively by Topmuller's tactical approach. To the advanced playmakers, and first up is World Cup winner, and player whose name you really want to spell correctly when googling, Mario Goetze. Truth be told, it's very underwhelming. The 90th percentile for shots and 95th percentile for possession won are not metrics you'd expect to stand out for a playmaker. And whilst 55th percentile for expected assists is above average, you'd expect more from someone of his caliber. That said, Frankfurt scored 33 goals in all competitions, and Goetze accounted for almost a third of them. His partner in crime was Faraz Aibi, who was marginally worse in almost every aspect, except progressive passes. What we're seeing here is likely to be indicative of the disconnect I spoke about earlier between the defensive and attacking units. Neither player is seeing much of the ball, despite both being playmakers, and so the opportunities to showcase their creativity has been limited. Paxton Aronson was the backup here, and he was even worse. Up front, Omar Marmouche was the starter. As the main goal-scoring threat, five goals is a measly return, and he underperformed his XG by roughly 25%. But that means he should have only scored six goals, speaking once more to the lack of attacking output from the team as a whole. In the 70th percentile for dribbles, and with his best role apparently being a winger, there is also the suggestion that Marmouche is a square peg in a round hole which leads us to Jesset Gankamp. As many goals in half the minutes, his performance is more befitting of a traditional striker. A 37% header win rate is pretty impressive, from a player under 6 foot, and his high volume shooting, in the 95th percentile for shots, shows his ability to get in the right place. He has still underperformed his XG though. All in all, I think this is quite a balanced squad, perhaps a little on the large side, but it has a healthy spread of players across age groups. If we fix the tactical shortcomings, I think that'll go a long way towards getting Eintracht Frankfurt near to where they're expected to be. So let's talk about the tactic. Same disclaimer as before. Part of this series is to provide a simple tactic based on what we've learned about the team and the players that could serve as a base for you to build upon. I'll be simulating through with my suggested transfers at the end of this video, but anything suggested here can, and will, be improved by making adjustments to what you see during a game. We'll be going with a high-pressing, possession-based 4-3-3. A different shape to Topmuller, but not necessarily a significant departure from him stylistically. In possession, we'll form a 2-3 build-up shape, with an inverted wing-back stepping into midfield to help us establish good lateral support to our front line. We'll use a deep blind playmaker to help aid that progression between the units. The left sided fullback will be responsible for joining the attack, along with an attacking Mazala to create our front five. An inside forward will be the secondary goal threat, whilst on the right, a winger will be used to provide width. A deep line forward should help create space for the inside forward while still remaining a goal threat. Just three instructions play out of defence pass shorter, and run at defence. In transition, we'll counter-press. I will probably say this in every single episode, 
it's the best time to win back the ball and we have bodies forward. We will also encourage the goalkeeper to distribute short because we're building up from deep. Out of possession, we're going to be aggressive. We have pace in our back line so we can be risky and we'll maintain our high engagement even if the initial counter press is bypassed. This is a team that has shown that they are capable defensively and that in turn gives us license to be a little bit more cavalier. In terms of individual instructions, the midfield trio have been told to tackle harder. We've also asked the deep line playmaker to stay wider to help cover the more attacking flank. And the inside forward has been asked to sit narrower to open the space for the fullback. They will also be allowed to roam from position to give them the freedom to drift when the opportunity arises. With that in mind, this is my assessment of the squad. A few things to note. Elias Skiri cannot start in two positions. Faris Haibi is our primary backup option in multiple positions. Robin Koch is our primary backup option in multiple other positions. And there's a handful of players who did not play enough minutes in the simulation for us to make a fair assessment of. With a transfer budget of 15 million euros and 125,000 per week to spare on wages, we should be able to bring in reinforcements. The board wants players under 23 years old, and we're looking for players who we can sign for less than the current incumbent in the first team. Let's start up front. I am looking for a backup, but someone who could, potentially, usurp Jesik Gankam in the starting lineup. He will be the comparison point. I am looking for a player I can purchase for under 4 million euros who will earn less than 31,500 per week and who performs better than the following metrics. Expected assists, shot accuracy, headers one ratio and possession lost. I am also looking for players who are outperforming their XG. Up first is Hamburg's Hungarian striker Andras Nemeth. He's a high volume shooter in the 99th percentile in fact, and a high volume goal scorer. In the 55th percentile for expected assists, he is above average at creating for others, but his main contribution is goals. Having joined Hamburg in January 2023, he's already settled in Germany and available at a bargain price. Or not. Despite the opportunity to step up a division, he wants to stay loyal to the team who bought him six months ago and so we'll add him to the discard pile, but one to keep an eye on for sure. Perhaps Adrian Benedicak is the option. The Parma striker is currently playing in Serie B, and like Nemeth, is an expected goalscorer. He has fewer shooting opportunities, but a comparable conversion rate and better XG over performance. He's not as creative, in only the 40th percentile for expected assists, but he is a stronger carrier of the ball. Valued between 200,000 and 2 million euros, he is a very affordable option. Or what about Fotis Yanidis? The Panathinaikos striker is arguably the best of the lot, which is to be expected as he is also the oldest and for those very reasons, also the most expensive. In the 90th percentile for expected assists, he should excel as a deep line forward and would definitely fit the bill for someone who could properly compete with Gankamp for the starting job. But I can't make that decision right now. What we spend here will impact what we spend elsewhere, and so let's take a look at our other areas of need. The obvious need is in midfield. Elias Skiri might have done the job of two men when playing alongside Sebastian Roder, but that is not a recipe for success. As he is better in the defensive phase, we will look for a deep line playmaker. We'll still use Skiri as the comparison point though. His transfer value is far above our budget, so we have no major worries there. I am looking for a player who is comparable in the following. Open play key passes, aggressive passes, pass completion, and tackle success rate. I say comparable because in this situation, there are not many players who are better in all those areas and affordable. Instead, players need to be better at or within 2% of the value of those metrics. First up is Dario Asugo. The sporting youngster is without doubt quite raw, but in a midfield that would likely boast Skiri and Goetze, 
there would be a good support structure alongside him. He does excel in expected assists, in the 85th percentile for defensive midfielders, and is in the 55th percentile for aggressive passes. With a top asking price of around 4 million euros, he would be a very intriguing budget option. We're back to Palmer for the second option, and it's a player I've looked at before. Adrian Bernabe is a former Barcelona and Man City youngster who absolutely ran the show in Serie B. His defensive contribution and desire to be a starter saw us passing by for Sevilla, but neither would be a concern in our setup here. He is four years the senior to Asugo, so it's no surprise that he is better in virtually all aspects, and subsequently double the price. Finally, we have Atletico Mineiro's Rubens. Naturally a central midfielder, he was often used as a left-back, and so we have to be aware of that when assessing his performance. What stands out to me is that despite seeing less of the ball than he would as a midfielder, he was still remarkably progressive with it, and he would offer more defensive balance than the other two. He is also playing at a higher level, and the adjustment to Bundesliga football might be easier. Unfortunately, that also means he might cost up to 12 million euros. Once again, I can't quite make a decision yet, so back to the squad planner. There is one more position I want to address. Angsnar Nauf did not feature much under Top Muller, and when he did, it was as a wingback. I need a starting right winger. Like Skiri, his transfer value is massive, and so all options will be well under. We do need to be mindful that wages need to stay under 34,500 euros though. For this, we are looking for players who are better at dribbles, expected assists, cross completion rate, and possession lost. Dancing down the wing is Winterthur's Samuel Ballet. The 22 year old is in the 75th percentile for successful dribbles, and perhaps somewhat surprising given his low aerial rating, in the 85th percentile for headers one. His end product isn't great registering only 0.11 expected assists per 90, but he looks to be an exciting player with explosive quickness and a very friendly price tag. Or perhaps Cesar Huerta. The Pumas winger appeared to be good at, well, everything. In the 70th percentile for dribbles, 65th for expected assists and 80th for shots, he does exciting things and he does them frequently. Moreover, he's also in the 50th percentile for possession lost, showing he's not careless with the ball either. That said, he likes to get forward often, and that gives me some cause for concern when it comes to a supportive winger role. Finally, Scrabble top score, Ezekiel Zabalos. As dribbly as Huerta before him, his creative output is sensational, with 0.25 expected assists per 90. This might, in part, be due to a stat not shown here, his 17.25% successful cross rate. His penchant for a bit of trickery is the kind of thing that I also feel is appealing. It's nice to get the fans fired up. Playing on the right, he has the kind of profile I want from a winger, but is also likely to be the most expensive. And so, those are our options. My preferred options would be Yanidis, Bernabe, and Zabalos but sadly the finances won't quite work. Whilst I am willing to engage in a little bit of budget manipulation, be that reallocating money or spreading some payments over multiple years, I am unwilling to go over 10% of our original budget. At most, 16.5 million euros total. Bernabe is the priority, and he'll cost us a cool 7 million euros and 29,500 in wages. Between striker and winger, it is the winger who will come in as a starter, and so Huerta is my preferred option here, but he'll cost us 6.5 million euros and 30,000 in wages. That means Benedicac will be our striker. It took the top end of his valuation, 1.9 million euros, to pry him from Palmer, putting us over the budget by 3%, and we'll be paying him 27.5 euros per week. That leaves the squad looking something a little like this. A key thing to note is that my assessment and the AI's assessment, as indicated by star ratings, does not line up. 
so we'll run some holiday simulations with players set in certain positions, and then run an additional test using instant result. So how did we get on? Third, fourth, and seventh. With the goal of breaking into the top four, I'm pretty satisfied to have achieved it two out of three times. And how did our signings get on? Adrian Bernabe was sensational. Across the three simulations, he racked up 37 assists and scored another 14 too. His defensive contribution was, as expected, negligible, but his ability to progress the ball through passing and carrying was evident throughout. Cesar Huerta was not as impressive, but still did rather well. 13 goal contributions in the first sim, 16 in the last. Let down a little in the middle though. As a supporting winger, he shot less frequently, but by and large, he showed that combination of dribbling threat, creativity and ball security that we signed him for. Finally, Benedicak. He had the unfortunate distinction of being behind Gankam, who was hard selected as the starter for the simulations. In fact, his opportunities were so limited by this setting that he was loaned out in the final simulation. He scored 10 goals in approximately 1100 minutes though. Not bad at all. But this is why I also ran a simulation with instant result, allowing us to rotate the squad more in line with my assessment and react a little bit more to the form of players. And boy did that go well. We finished second, eight points off Bayern Munich. It was however, very similar to the severe episode where we held top spot for a large swath of the season Injuries to key players told, but I'm happy nonetheless. In this instant result world, some things stayed the same. Bernabe was still as impressive, and whilst he only had 10 goal contributions, this was because he played fewer minutes as we were able to rotate him. Cesar Huerta was equally pleasing, with 14 goal contributions overall. He played quite a few games on the left as we battled against injuries and form, and this resulted in his dribbles per game dropping quite a bit compared to the holiday simulations. Those injuries I referred to mostly occurred up front, and that gave Benedicak his chance. 16 goals in 2100 minutes is fantastic, a massive XG over performance and achieved from so few shots. 37% conversion rate is unreal. All these saves and the tactic are linked in the description below, but before I go, I do want to address some surprises and things I got wrong. Smolcic was, in my initial assessment, our fourth best centre back. By the end of the instant results sim, he was my first choice. His tackle success rate and header win rate was better than Pacho's, and perhaps more tellingly, so was his win rate. We won 64% of the games that Smolcic played, compared to only 50% with Pacho. In fact, his injury at the tail end of the season was perhaps the biggest contributing factor to our late fall away. Niels and Kunku was not part of my initial assessment because he played too few minutes. He was, however, a revelation. Philip Max got injured during pre-season and Nkunku took the chance with both hands. 24 assists is crazy. He wasn't negligent in his defensive responsibilities either, winning more than half of his aerial duels and 78% of his tackles. Finally, Eric Junior Dina Ibimbe was brilliant as an inverted wingback. As a natural central midfielder, he was comfortable in those areas of the pitch and his contribution in all phases was wonderful. When I first looked at this squad, I thought that fullback was going to be a position of dire need, but I'm delighted that we were able to solve this internally. So how do you think I got on? Would you have done anything differently? Let me know below, and if you enjoyed this video, please consider subscribing. See you next time.